Good to be able to worship together today. It's nice to see you all. This morning I'm combining actually two thoughts. I did that last time. We have to get to stands that will hold a, the weight of God's word. <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, two thoughts. I want to start off with the Gospel of John. That's where I started the week and ended up someplace else. But uh, I was so impressed with what I had read and studied, I felt like I needed to share it with you. And it does actually tie in with the second part of what I'm going to be talking about, and that is how faith um, works as it's lived out in the life of people. But uh, John Pauline is a New Testament scholar uh, who has specialized his studies in John's writings both Revelation and the books of John. And one of the things that he pointed out to me that I hadn't seen before is uh, the purpose of John in a different way. Uh, Bible scholars believe that John probably wrote his book, it very likely was the last book uh, of the New Testament written, about 95. And... So when we think about the time that that's written, a lot of the first generation Christians had already died. So then we ask, who is John writing to? Who is he writing for? And um, something interesting has happened. Remember, at the first part of uh, John 1, he ends up telling us about, uh, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. So he starts off by identifying Christ with the word. It isn't until John 20, 31 that he tells us why he wrote that book. And he says in that book, in, in John 20, 31, that he wrote it for those who uh, weren't able to see, yet believe, and that... Uh, by believing, we might have life in Christ's name. That it would transform our lives. Well, just before he wrote that, those two uh, 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 texts, we have the story of Thomas. You know, he's referred to as Doubting Thomas, but it's really quite interesting. Remember, Thomas is referred to as Doubting Thomas because he didn't believe even the testimony of individuals who told him that Christ had risen from the dead. I'm not going to believe until I actually see with my own eyes and put my finger there in that spot. Right after that story, right after, the very next thing is where John tells us why he wrote the book. And so... John Pauline suggests, and I think, he's, I think it's correct, that John wrote the book for second-generation Christians. That's you and me. He wrote the book for you and me. We have not seen, we have not experienced the miracles that Jesus did um, for the disciples, with the disciples, for Lazarus and others. We have not seen that. But John wanted us to understand that the word, that the word is just as reliable as the acts. The things that he says, he's reliable, he's trustworthy, you can depend on him. And so throughout the ages, we look back over time and see how individuals have trusted the word, trusted it in spite of the difficulties. And so I share with you this morning the lives of <clears throat> some people who made a decision to trust the word. Do you remember playing follow the leader as a child? I'm at the, <laughs> I'm at the place in my life where... <laughs> I just love kids. I love to see the exuberance of children and the innocence of children. 
and children laughing. Is there, is there hardly a better sound than the laughter of a child? It is just so sweet. The person you were following when you played follow the leader would sometimes take you places you didn't really want to go. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it was scary. Sometimes it was just plain hard to do the things that the leader did. It's a lot like life, isn't it? And uh, there are times that life is difficult and we don't uh, always feel like following the leader. On November 20, 1908, Solomon and Katharina and their ten children left Russia for Bremen, Germany. Left actually the Ukraine, the Odessa area. And they were immigrating to America. Why? Well, this is their story. One night, Solomon awakened from his sleep to hear an audible voice which said, Go to America. Go to America. Solomon was a devout Christian. He was raised as a Lutheran and then joined the Baptist church as an adult. And then later on, after careful Bible study, became a Seventh-day Adventist. But this voice was something new in his religious experience. For many nights, Solomon awakened to hear the same audible voice speaking, Go to America. Go to America. He became bewildered and frightened because he did not understand what the voice meant. And he told his wife about the voice and they prayed that God would stop the voice as it frightened them. And after their prayer, Solomon didn't hear the voice for some time. One night, he heard that audible voice again, but not as strong as it had been at first. He went back to sleep and he had a dream. In the dream, Solomon saw terrible times coming to Russia. Times became very hard. He saw starving people begging for food and shelter. I don't know if any of you have read the history of the Ukraine. Um, know anything about that, but what he saw in his dream uh, was fulfilled in the early 1930s. That millions of Ukrainians starved to death under Stalin. They took the food that was in the Ukraine. The Ukraine is actually kind of a breadbasket. Uh, it's like middle America where uh, lots of grain is grown and it's, it's rich, fertile lands. That they, uh, Stalin took all of the food out of that area and shipped it away. And so the Ukrainians, those, the Russians that were there, starved to death, literally by the millions during that time. That's what, that's what Solomon saw in his dream. After the dream, the audible voice returned many times saying, go to America, go to America. Solomon told Katharina that he knew God spoke to him because he heard the voice so loud and clear telling him to go to America. The calling of God in one's life and how he speaks to us is a mysterious thing. Now going back to biblical times, 427 years after the flood, God spoke to another man. That this is what he said. We find it in Genesis, the 12th chapter, and the first verse. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I wonder what that was like for him. To be told by God to move. There wasn't any indication that they were nomadic people. God is asking him, no, really commanding him to move from his home to go to another country. 
God is asking him to separate from his past, his heritage, his roots. Notice what the passage says. Abram was to go from his country, his relatives, and his father's house. This is pretty clear. God is saying, I want you to make a total break with your past. One Bible commentary suggests that Abraham's call occurred actually in two stages. And the first call from Ur was to leave his ancestral homeland, and the second call from Haran to forsake his immediate relatives. Have you ever had difficulty moving from one place to another, one home to another? When my grandparents, Solomon and Katharina, felt called to come to America, it was not easy for them to say goodbye to all of their family and, and all of their history. In fact, they sold all of their things two different times before they had the courage to leave and leave for good. All of their possessions were either sold or packed into trunks and prepared for shipment. They didn't take any of their livestock. They didn't take uh, their equipment to the new country. They had their trunks. They had themselves and their ten children. But it was comforting for them to know that God was leading them and that he would be with them wherever they went. I can tell you from personal experience, it's not easy to pack up and leave your friends and family to go to a different country. In 1978, I received a call from the General Conference to go to Southeast Asia. To become the publishing director of the Southeast Asia Union Mission. We had just built a new home in the country. We sold all of our possessions. And when it was all said and done, we ended up with a stack of boxes six feet wide, six feet high, in, one, in the corner of one bedroom. That was it. It was a sober moment for us. I still remember the day standing in that bedroom looking at that stack of boxes with the realization that this was it. This was all that I had left. We were leaving everything behind, family, friends, and possessions. But it was comforting to know that God was going to be with us wherever we went. Why did my grandparents do it? They made this move because of their love for God and a deep desire to be obedient to him. Why did I do it? I did it because on December of 1969, I felt a deep conviction of the call of God on my life. And this was one more yes to him. The call in Isaiah 6 that says, Then I heard a voice, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. I had a deep conviction that God was calling our family to go. Why did Abraham leave everything to go to a place he didn't know anything about? Hebrews 11, verse 10 says, For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was seeing spiritually and not physically. He was responding. I really believe this. He was responding to the longing for home that God has put within each one of us. 
I would like you to notice how God called Abraham. It involves two things. First is the command, and second is the promise. I might mention that this is not always how it works, but there are many instances in the Bible that where this is exactly what has happened. So first of all is the command. The Lord had said to, notice this now in Genesis 12, 1, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. So that's the command. Now notice the promise. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The interesting thing about this call is that it involves a covenant. A promise made by God that is unconditional. This speaks of the amazing love of God. And when we read the Bible, there is no indication that Abraham is worthy because of something special he has done. Abraham's name just pops up. There it is. In fact, there's nothing recorded about him except his lineage. We have no idea why God selected him. But we can only imagine and assume that Abraham had a sensitivity and an openness to God, and God saw that quality, him, quality in him. Maybe it was that he was teachable, trusting. That leads me to another question, another thought. Why did he pick you? I'm serious when I say that. Why did he pick you? He did, you know. He did. Does he see something in you that is special? One of Abraham's characteristics is obedience. We could ask, well, how did he do it? And the Bible says very clearly, by faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham. What is faith? Well, Hebrews 11, verse 1 says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It is believing what God said. Maybe it's, maybe it's really more about believing God, believing in God. That God always has my best interest in mind. Abraham's belief carried over into action. And it says of him so. In verse four, chapter 12 verse 4. So Abram left. Left. As the Lord had told him. He took his family. His possessions. And he left town. He did all of this. Without being able to see. Around the next bend. Quite often, that's the way God works. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> I've lived long enough to be thankful that uh, I can't see the future. Yeah. He doesn't tell us everything that will happen when we say yes to him. Our job is just to do the next right thing, to obey one step at a time, one day at a time. Chinese have this wonderful little proverb. You've probably heard it too, but it says the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. That's the way faith is. I had a classmate that I went to high school with who felt called to become a missionary pilot. He was called by the Far Eastern Academy 
to fly missionaries around Indonesia and, and others, workers around, uh, you know, Indonesia. I don't know if you know much about Indonesia. You re heard recently that they had the earthquake down there and then they had um, that other great uh, flood that happened to them. If you look at a map of Indonesia and take a map of Indonesia, if you were to take that map and transpose it over the United States of America, it would actually hang out on both ends. You see all those islands out there, you don't think much of it, but it actually is a vast, vast area. And Ken uh, felt a call to uh, become a missionary pilot. Ken and I went to Auburn Academy together. I made it a year and a half, and he made it three years. <clears throat> and uh, then his mother moved him down to, uh, I think it was Campion or another academy. Maybe there's one in Arizona. I hadn't seen Ken in about 20 years. And I heard that he was out there flying. And... When I heard that and found that out, and our lives had taken different turns and things had happened and got married and had kids and all that sort of thing. Well, when I heard that Ken was in town, he'd flew into the division office and had some things to do, some meetings or something. I uh, got a hold of Ken and Ken came over to our house. We spent some time together reminiscing and about our lives and what had happened, what had transpired. But mainly we reminisced about the goodness of God and how God reached down and touched our lives. Ken left Auburn Academy and went to the other academy because his mother felt like he wasn't doing good up there. And it was his senior year that Ken was converted. Gave his life to Christ and changed the direction of his life. It took me until I was 25 for that to happen to me. And uh, well, we had a wonderful time just reminiscing and sharing and, and uh, about God's goodness. It wasn't long after our visit that his plane went down. And uh, to this day, there's never been a trace found. Not one piece of anything. Nothing. Nothing. He had just dropped off workers and was going home. And he disappeared. He did not know that would happen when he said yes to God and answered the call to service. God doesn't seem to reveal the future to us, only the present. And he invites us to respond with a, re with a yes, regardless of the future. Because our future is secure. Abraham said yes, and that was the important thing. He did not know how his faith would be tested. And oh, oh how it was tested. Just think about some of the things he faced. God promised to make a great nation out of his children and he didn't even have any kids. Stress and tension between his servants and Lot's servants and also between Sarah and Hagar. He had to fight a battle against significant odds to rescue Lot and his family. He was promised all this land and yet wandered all over the land of Canaan and even went down into Egypt out of that land that God had promised him. He was asked to offer the promised heir, his son, as a sacrifice on the altar. How did he do it? Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith, Abraham. By faith. When called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I need to speak a little bit more about that even though part. What had God told him? He said, go to the land I will show you. Abraham, 
he may have had a few questions. Do you suppose? Like, could you maybe just show me? Or, you know, before I start out across that desert and wonder where I'm going to end up and uh, when, when will it actually be, God? Uh, how many days or months or years? When, when will it happen? Questions, questions, questions. But that isn't what happened. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going. Can you look back over your life and see how God has led you, even though? At the time you began the journey, you didn't know where the journey would take you. What must it have been like for Solomon and Katharina when they stood on the deck of the ship as it steamed out of Bremen, Germany? The following was taken from a book written by their son, Theodore and gives you a small glimpse of their feelings. That was Uncle Ted. This is what he writes in the book. When Solomon and Catherine returned from the trip to Crimea, they sold all their belongings at an auction sale. Sadly, Catherine parted with her beautiful furniture. By, by the way, I forget now who made that furniture, but it was all handmade furniture. It was, the, they just, in the book, it describes it as beautiful furniture. With sorrow, Catherine parted from her parents and her family, realizing she may never see them again. What must it have been like for Abraham to leave Haran? Maybe he too had some sadness in his heart and some fear in the pit of his stomach, even though. Now God said to Abraham, Abram, I should say, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you. And by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Why? For he was looking forward to a city whose with foundations whose architect and builder is God. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase when we see Christ. Ken Geyer writes this about Van Gogh in his book, The Weathering Grace of God. He says, Van Gogh is known for his paintings, not his sermons, yet one led to the other as naturally as spring leads to summer. His first pastor was in a tumble-down town of coal miners where he lived among them, sharing their poverty, going with them into the mines and into their homes and tending the sick and conducting Sunday services. The sermon I'm thinking about, he says, is one he preached in 1877. As the text for his message, he uses a biblical passage that compared life to a pilgrimage, and he told the weary minders that they were strangers on this earth, that all of us were stranger, strangers on this earth, fellow travelers on our way home. And Van Gogh talked about the joys and sorrows of that journey and then used a painting of an autumn landscape to illustrate his point. In the distance was a row of mountains and they stood hazed in the dusk and the peaks splayed the setting sun whose rays touched the underbellies of clouds and turning common silver to gold and gold to royal purple. The leaves of the landscape were yellow like the late summer leaves of Colorado aspen. And the road, much like the one I'm traveling, cut through the landscape to a distant mountain. Crowning the mountain was a city 
glowing in the sunset. And on the road was a weary traveler. Van Gogh told them, staff in hand, who encountered an angel that had been placed there to encourage those on their way to the eternal city. And then Van Gogh gave the words that he imagined might have passed between the traveler and the angel. The traveler asked, does the road go uphill all the way? The angel answered, yes, to the very end. He asked again, will the journey take all the day will the journey take all day long? And he the angel answered, From morn till night, my friend. The traveler journeyed on, sorrowful yet rejoicing. Sorrowful because the road was so steep and long, rejoicing because he was closer to the destination that was home to his deepest longings. As he continued the climb, a quiet prayer rose from his lips. Then I shall be more and more tired, but also nearer and nearer to thee. By faith, Abraham, when called, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. As we sing our closing hymn, I want to today make an invitation. I want to make a Threefold invitation. <clears throat> if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, I want to give you the invitation, the opportunity to respond today to that invitation. To come and join me here at the front. If you're a, an individual who has been following Christ but has never been baptized, and would like to be. The Spirit's been convicting you. It's time for me to be baptized. To make that further step for Christ. I want to invite you to come. If you're new to Pleasant Valley. And have uh, not yet joined us. As a congregation. But you really want to do that. I'd like to invite you to come today. So I can introduce you to the congregation and welcome you to become part of our family. So if you never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you have not been baptized but want to, and uh, if you're new to our community, come. <clears throat>